Hey, hey, Wealth Builders, Simon Dixon here, and Happy New Year 2024. I know we're already a few weeks in, but this is the first Bitcoin Hard Talk of 2024. So welcome to Bitcoin Hard Talk episode 17. And today we're going to be going through my 2024 predictions. If you're new to Bitcoin Hard Talk, this is where we talk hard talk about hard money and I've got, I was listening to it live on my phone. So thanks for that. Uh, I know it's working now, at least anyway. Uh, so this is where we talk, uh, we do hard talk about hard money. Uh, I spent the last two decades of my life on Bitcoin investing and money, uh, 15th year into Bitcoin now. And we're going to be doing a little bit of review of some of the predictions that I'm going to be making for 2024. For those of you familiar with previous episodes, you know that we talk about proof of work, which is Bitcoin the mechanism that allows us to have money you can own, money you can spend, and money that has a fixed supply that no central bank on the proof of weapons network, which is fiat currency, uh, backed by the largest military forces that creates world reserve currencies, that creates pump and dump Ponzi schemes that recycle themselves every 100 years and leads to the catastrophic type of events that we're experiencing in real time right now. So we're going to be discussing all the latest in Bitcoin, geopolitics and macro so that you can build and protect your wealth and get ahead of the cycle. So we last left off uh, episode 16. I did Bitcoin 2023 year and review. And ever since the big FTX Ponzi scheme collapsed, it wasn't quite a Ponzi scheme, actually. Celsius was the Ponzi scheme. FTX was just a fraudulent theft. Um, but ever since uh, that happened, I was saying in our market, in our industry, we've got three more cases to get through. One of those is Binance, or if you're listening to the US government, Binance. Um, and uh, once we got Binance to get through, we got Digital Currency Group. And then we got what the regulators are going to do with stable coins. So we still have some of those hangovers. And uh, we found out what was going to happen to Binance or Binance, if you know what you're talking about. Uh, so let's just do a quick review of where we left off in December 2023. Uh, firstly, Barry Silbert from Digital Currency Group, he decided uh, to step down from Digital Currency Group. Um, the, the, the structure that he created was compared uh, to Enron. Uh, we also had CZ who had to step down from Binance. Uh, and that was where he was being accused of money laundering and servicing without licenses. Um, we also had an old case um, in 2024, which was pretty hilarious, actually. But uh, for those that were involved in the Mt. Gox collapse in, 20, in 2014, approximately 10 years later, um, the first creditor payments have gone out. Uh, you'll notice a common theme in all of these cases. Somebody puts a bunch of their Bitcoin at an exchange. They go into bankruptcy because they lose a bunch of Bitcoin because they essentially follow the fiat currency proof of weapons network and become a fractional reserve bank because once you deposit it uh, at a bank, once you deposit your money at a bank, the bank becomes the legal owner of your money and then they spend it as they choose. And so when that happens, you end up with fractional reserve, uh, which is where all money is backed by debt in the fiat currency system. And then certain exchanges that didn't have all the financial controls in place would end up with fractional reserve Bitcoin, essentially, uh, where they would promise more Bitcoin obligations to their customers than they actually had because they lost them. Um, and so Mt. Gox was one of those. They lost, in fact, 90 percent of the Bitcoins. But the price of Bitcoin went up so much that they almost uh, could make all of their bankruptcy creditors whole because they dollarized the claim. The price of Bitcoin goes up into a multi-billion dollar recovery um, and they get bailed out by Bitcoin. But the people that got left behind don't get the upside of Bitcoin. Barry Silbert essentially did the same. Uh, he had a subsidiary, uh, which was a Genesis um, that was also uh, took another company, Gemini, um, into bankruptcy. Um, and they dollarized the claim, benefited from the growth in Bitcoin and left the customers getting a dollar claim while they benefit from the Bitcoin. And he was also involved in the infamous ETF. So that's going to be my first thing um, that I'm going to be covering. 
Now, with the Mt. Gox case, there was this hilarious thing where they decided to use PayPal in order to settle all of the creditors' Bitcoin, but they accidentally paid a bunch of their customers twice. And uh, obviously, a bunch of people had withdrawn that Bitcoin, and uh, the trust had to reach out to everybody saying, please give the Bitcoin back, because that's going to harm the other creditors. We didn't mean to pay you twice. This is what happens when you allow these different companies to print fake Bitcoin versus the real Bitcoin that you own um, in your own cold storage wallet. Eventually, everyone will get there, but it's just a lesson uh, to learn from the banking system. Now, uh, some of the creditors wrote back to them and saying, screw you, um, if you want the Bitcoin back, uh, firstly, you're going to have to wait another 10 years. Um, and uh, they said that, you know, and uh, you won't benefit from the upside as well. So that was pretty hilarious. But congratulations to any of the older uh, Mount Gox people. So um, basically, yeah, they said they're double payment. Right. What else happened on the geopolitical side? Well, we had a serious expansion of BRIC. Uh, BRIC is the network that is trying to create a global world, world reserve currency uh, for those that feel completely shafted by the dollar scheme. And so this was originally Brit, uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, BRICS, um, and other people have uh, joined over time. But there was a serious um, injection of might behind it with many players in the Middle East joining it. Now, some of these players have historically been friends of the United States, the current world reserve currency on the proof of weapons network. You know, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, uh, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, um, and then enemies as well, like Iran. Uh, Ethiopia also joined. Um, and so they have all joined this alliance that are engaging in de-dollarization, where they're deciding to settle oil with each other outside of the dollar system. Uh, this is a significant threat to the dominance of the current proof of weapons network, which is backed by the largest military industrial complex that the world has ever seen in terms of foreign policy and bases all around the world in order to try and maintain the existing world order within the United States. We saw this in the you know equivalent in previous empires like the British Empire. And prior to that, we saw it with the Dutch Empire. And then you have colonialism, um, which is used in order to use the world reserve currency in order to expand its land like the British Empire. Um, and then you get all these different types of conflicts. And eventually, the cost of maintaining the military industrial complex puts the country into a lack of profit. So in the case of America, you've got approximately 127, 130% debt to GDP, you know, a $27 trillion economy with $34 trillion worth of debt that's about to hit $1 trillion in interest payments because interest rates are going up and they have to incentivize people with higher rates in order to lend to a government where their credit rating is being called into question. Um, and then eventually you get this 10 to 20 year transition to the next proof of weapons network. And it's always excessive debt that leads into bloody wars in between. Just look at cyclical history and you'll see this time and time again. So BRICS is preparing for that eventuality. Now, this becomes geopolitically significant when I start going through the 2024 predictions. Also significant was that Argentina decided to withdraw from BRICS. It decided to go for dollarization, close its central bank, and may have a Bitcoin play as well. Um, so they have decided to go in a slightly different direction. And what you tend to see during wartime economics on the proof of weapons network is people need to pick alliances and sides. And there are certain key decision makers which are deciding that have historically gone for normalization, but they're deciding which side. Argentina has decided to go on the US dollar proof of weapons network. But others are deciding to go into the BRICS proof of weapons network, which also will be building central bank digital currencies and creating you know, networks for clearing oil. So it's all about nuclear oil and you have to watch those trends. Okay, 
So all of those things uh, happened. Right. So now that brings us into 2024. So uh, I had a bet with uh, Rob from Digital Asset News. I uploaded it to my YouTube channel if you want to see that, uh, where uh, the loser of the bet had to wear an I Love Mijinsky t-shirt. Uh, just for those of you that don't know, that's a guy that scammed 650,000 creditors, including a combined $3 billion from many pensioners, destroyed their life and their life savings. Uh, and we've been working for a year and a half in order to fix it. Uh, but I had a bet that if the Bitcoin ETF, which is a way for pensioners and funds and traditional finance institutions to rather than having to buy Bitcoin, they can buy a stock on the stock market, which is backed by Bitcoin. So Bitcoin ETFs are now here. I bet with him last year that the Bitcoin ETF would be approved in Q1 2024. It got approved and it has actually been one of the most successful ETF launches of all time. So the Bitcoin ETF is now here. I won that bet. Um, thank you for honoring that bet. And if you want to see Dig Rob from Digital Asset News wearing the I Love Mijinsky t-shirt, he, he, he cheated a little bit. Um, but uh, if you watch that video, you can see a little bit more about that as well. Uh, so we got it launched in January. Um, I thought it was going to launch in February, actually, but it became uh, more and more apparent that it was going to be January. Um, and we now have the two largest commodity-backed ETFs in the entire world is gold and Bitcoin. Now, the largest ETFs are more like U.S. stocks, like um, you know the S&P 500 index. But the two largest commodity stocks are now gold and Bitcoin. So in January, um, I expect that to significantly increase and start to catch up with the market cap of the gold Bitcoin ETF. Hopefully, if you've been watching my videos, you won't necessarily be buying through an ETF unless it's through some kind of asset protection structure for tax deferral. Uh, we can cover more of that in future videos. Um, but if you're doing it in your own name, then you should be owning, having some money where you own it, you control it as a protection against the inflation, the confiscation, and the atrocities of the Proof of Weapons Network. So just to give context to how successful this launch was, the gold ETF currently holds about $96.3 billion of gold that backs it. And it launched 21 years ago. We love the number 21 because Bitcoin um, is, uh, there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins. Most of them are lost. And as people lose them, not most of them, a chunk of them are lost. Uh, and as people lose them, the scarcity becomes bigger and bigger. So while you benefit from it, if you don't lose them, uh, if you, uh, you know, if you do lose them, you've got to make sure you're not one of those people. And so there's very good principles that you can have. And some of those people will decide to put it into an ETF and outsource that custody to a company like the ones that uh, I invested in very early, a company like Coinbase. Well, anyway, the Bitcoin ETF currently holds $27.5 billion and 11 of them launched nine days ago. Now, we also know that one of the subsidiaries of Digital Currency Group that we talked about earlier is Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. And because that has a significantly higher fee, people are taking the billions of dollars, the 650000 that's locked up in uh, GBTC, which is that subsidiary, selling it off and buying other Bitcoin ETFs, which caught some downward pressure. Now, remember what I always teach, Bitcoin thinking, proof of work thinking, not fiat currency dollar thinking. Fiat currency thinking gets you wrecked on the proof of weapons network. If you were looking for a big pump in the price, you were let down. But if you're using valuing your wealth in Bitcoin, then the lower the price goes, the more Bitcoin you accumulate every month. If you're following some of the basic principles that I've been teaching on this channel for over 11 years now, um, since the first Bitcoin conference. Wow, how long ago was that? 13 years ago. Um, since I spoke at the first Bitcoin conference. Um, and so, yeah, so fiat thinking means that that's good, but we got one of the most successful Bitcoin ETF launch, the second largest uh, commodity in the world. And we had a correction in the price that allows people to accumulate cheaper because they had to unwind. And we learned 
Remember what I was talking about? You've got to solve finance, which we solved last year. And there's an unwind model that you're experiencing. Now we've got digital currency group, a bit of an unwind model, repaid the debt in dollars that I talked about earlier, scammed the creditors out of the upside of certain Bitcoin. And now people are unwinding from that ETF over to another ETF. For example, the Vanguard ETF, Van Eyck, sorry, Van Eyck. Vanguard, oh no, we don't like Vanguard. Uh, Vanguard has banned their retirement uh, customers from buying the Bitcoin ETF. And it went into a massive outflow of people saying, I'm taking all of my Vanguard retirement fund and I'm putting with a Bitcoin maxi or a Bitcoin company like Fidelity, who have been involved in Bitcoin since 2014, mining, been good stewards of Bitcoin over this time, got their own custody set up. And so everyone's migrating away from Vanguard over to Fidelity. Everyone's migrating away from the, the expensive ETF of GBTC. And uh, Van Eyck is another one that decided to take a percentage of all the fees and put it towards funding Bitcoin developers to in uh, make sure that we can get more and more better features as we progress. But gold has been a store of value for approximately 5,000 years. So think of that comparison, 96 billion, 27 billion. Bitcoin, the gold ETF launched 21 years ago the Bitcoin ETFs launched nine days ago. The volume has been insane in terms of numbers. Those providers not being able to keep up with it. Gold has been a store of value for 5,000 years. Bitcoin has been what I call a speculative store of value, which is a big chunk of the world don't believe it's a store of value, but more and more people realize it every year. And because of the supply demand economics, the more people that realize it, they have to pay a higher price from those that are hodling it. And because they hodl it, it contracts the supply. The number of Bitcoins that are mined uh, gets, you know, decreases every four years. And so they have to pay a higher and higher price for it. And for 15 years, this has been the trend. And so I call it a speculative store of value because eventually it will probably be like gold in 5,000 years from now. Um, where, you know, people understand it, but it's the arbitrage that has made the massive increase in wealth over the last 15 years versus those that preserve their wealth in gold. Now, this isn't a gold versus Bitcoin debate. I own both. And the reason I own both is because Bitcoin has put savings back into the economy. And because it's more speculative, it has wealth creation opportunity. But as you get older, you like to preserve some of your wealth Gold is a hedge against Bitcoin. Um, and so if the whole internet goes down and various other things, we enter into Armageddon type of scenario. Uh, gold has been a wealth preserver, not wealth creator. Understand buckets and uh, we'll cover more and more of these things if you're more familiar with my content. Anyway, so the real question is, grandma has the Bitcoin, e uh, the gold ETF in their pension right now. But will the, her granddaughter even bother with the gold ETF in their pension? This is generational. And so more and more people are going for Bitcoin over gold. And you're seeing a contraction in the gold supply and market cap. Sorry, the gold market cap. Now, remember, gold actually adjusts to the price. As the price of gold goes up, more and more people are incentivized to find more gold dig deeper into the ground, innovate technology further. With Bitcoin, the supply is known completely into the future. So it's more scarce, is more understood, and you can't dig for more the higher the price goes. So will grandma's granddaughter have a gold ETF or Bitcoin ETF? Again, I don't want to make this a competition between the two, but in January, this trend is through. And so January 2024, the first prediction was... Bitcoin ETF and the first prediction came true. So now let's move over to February. What's going to be happening in February? Well, if you remember in 2022, we had the deleveraging of the crypto market where we created our Lehman Brothers of crypto moment 
where everybody was putting their Bitcoin with the equivalent of banks. They were committing fraudulent activity. And we had people that were creating their own currencies saying this is the next Bitcoin killer. This is the next stable coin. Um, and we had Do Kwon that was playing central banker. Well, his destiny will be known on January the 29th, 2024. And that will bring us into February, where we will know the outcome of what happens when you try and pay central banker and commit fraud without the blessing of the world's largest regulated Ponzi scheme that blesses the fraud, rolls it over into a Ponzi scheme and allows the central bank and the governments uh, to uh, roll it over, socialize all the losses, and then you create creating inflation that creates the proof of weapons network, rich poor divide, wealth inequality, and those that are connected to the central bank pay the lowest interest rates. This rolls over money where it gets to the point where the poorest in the world can no longer afford to roll over their debt. And then you have a massive deleveraging, a change of world reserve currency, and the end of a debt cycle onto the next military industrial complex that backs the next proof of weapons network. In World War I and World War II, America managed to get it where their country wasn't bombed and they funded the war. So that meant that UK, which was the existing world reserve currency, their country got destroyed and bombed. My father was born in 33. Uh, he was hiding under tables as the country got bombed uh, from the proof, of the proof of Weapons Network. But this time, China's probably going to play mediator and we'll see what happens if we escalate or we go into a full-blown currency war, technology war, as I've covered in previous episodes. Okay, so what's going to happen in February? Well, the next wave of proof of weapons network escalation is happening in real time. What's happening? Well, America and uh, OFAC and, uh, decided to sanction the Russian central bank and confiscate approximately $300 billion dollars of the Russian central bank that led to this de-dollarization wave where the other uh, the other countries you know um they don't want to leave their money because they know that America can just delete it and so it's got less utility as money because they know America can use it for political gains in order to try and uh you know perform its agenda and so they're looking at how can we fund Ukraine in the proof of weapons network in order to weaken Russia further and just essentially sacrifice more Ukrainian lives in a war and battle they can never win because Russia is such a superior force through its NATO expansion. And so they're going to sacrifice more Ukrainian lives by funding more so that Russia can retaliate in the proof of weapons network. But they're saying um, America doesn't want to pay the bill anymore. They're at the end of their debt cycle. They can't roll over further um, because more and more people are skeptical about that. And so they need to look at another source of funding. What are they doing? They're saying, let's take the money that we sanctioned and deleted from the Russian central bank and give it to your Ukraine to fund that NATO expansion and weaken Russia, which obviously was the original goal of NATO, an alliance during the Cold War, in order to ensure that communism does not expand its force um, and uh, that Russia can be weakened. So as if that actually happens, this would be the nail in the coffin for the dollar. Imagine what the world will say if you can literally take a Russian central bank any central bank. And if America doesn't like what they're doing, delete their money and give it to the enemy in order to weaken you militarily in the proof of weapons network. Now, the problem is, is that Russia has $2.2 trillion economy backed by oil and only $500 billion of debt. So they've been playing the proof of weapons network better. Now, people confuse me all the time. I'm a free market guy. I love Western economics. I love hard money. Do I want communism? No, but every country is going that way through their rolling over of the Ponzi scheme 
through the fractional reserve banking system because they outsource the ability to create money to the private banking system through central banks. And so therefore, every day, capitalist economies look more like communist economies and communist economies look more like capitalist economies until they meet in the middle with a central bank digital currency that then allows them through digital identity, uh, technological led negative interest rates, artificial intelligence, social credit scores, vaccines, all the stuff that you can program into the central bank digital currency. And so now Trump has come along and said, Vote for me. I won't allow it to happen. Probably not going to happen because Trump also said, I'll make sure that we take control of debt. Trump spent more and rolled over the proof of weapons network, handed over to Biden. All this bipartisan BS is systemic. It doesn't make any difference. The powers that be that control the proof of weapons network are the true powers in this system. So if you, they hand over the Russian central bank money and fund Ukraine in order to weaken Russia further in a war that could be a forever war and carries on, just like the Iraq war, uh, then they end up giving it back to the Taliban, which was the original, um, sorry, Al-Qaeda, which was the original intention anyway, uh, then you end up just rolling over the Ponzi scheme further. Why? Because the rules of the proof of weapons network when money is debt, is that if you want more debt, you have to have more money, which means you have to go deeper into debt. If you want less debt, you have to have less money. And that creates a deflationary cycle that then causes the um, people to take on more and more debt because they reduce interest rates in order to encourage people to take on more debt. And then as people take on more debt, this bogey called inflation comes along. When the bogey called inflation comes along, they increase rates to send the very people that saved the proof of weapons network by taking on more debt bankrupt. So they can't afford their debt. And those that pay the lowest interest rates benefit because they own all the assets at the expense of those that are rolling over their credit cards and consuming. And so that is the rules of the proof of weapons network, as I said. Right. So we just got to do a little bit more before we can then go into all of the other predictions with Bitcoin uh, macro and various other things. You've got to understand there is serious escalations in the proof of weapons network at the moment. So to help you understand a little bit more about this, because there is no way you can be a Bitcoiner, there is no way you can navigate this without following what is happening in some of the geopolitical as we potentially avoid World War III or escalate towards World War III. A lot of it, what we're seeing right now is escalation. And when you understand the nuclear networks, you can understand why we might avoid World War III or we might go flying into World War III. So let me just share a little bit about some of the trends that happened over the last slide so that we can then predict what may happen next so that we can position ourselves accordingly. So to understand the Middle East, there's lots of complications, but essentially you have two oil superpowers. Remember, it's all about oil. And so oil is what is going to be affected. Oil is what will lead to money printing in order to subsidize in the West the cost of living crisis that then creates a hyperinflationary cycle, as we saw in 2022. And Iran and Saudi Arabia are the most important there. It's why the US has been diversifying away from Middle Eastern oil exposure and also picking sides so that it can ensure that it gains control of certain natural gas resources as we more and more move over to electricity, like what is needed for the proof of work Bitcoin network as well. So you have Iran and Saudi Arabia that are arch rivals. Uh, then they needed to go through some kind of normalization in order to stabilize the world. And so in uh, the last attempt at stabilization was called the Iran nuclear deal. And the Iran nuclear deal after, uh, you know, um, uh, militia uh, forces like uh, the Houthis started attacking some of the oil fields in Saudi Arabia um, back then uh, was to try and normalize with Iran and try and broker peace with those. 
And that was all about, okay. Um, so essentially, yeah, we were talking about normalization between Iran and Saudi Arabia. A nuclear deal was signed with Iran. Trump reneged on that deal. When he reneged on it, he sent out an assassination order uh, for Qasem Soleimani, um, who was responsible for getting uh, different networks and funding out to uh, the different resistance movements that we're hearing about today that are currently engaging in these different types of Middle Eastern wars. Um, those were, you know, really set up as a result of the Iraqi invasion. The Iraqi invasion led to terrorist groups like ISIS um, being created, who were enemies of some of these um, groups like Iran and Iran. You know, you went through this whole destabilizing effect that happened as a result of that. Um, and they decided then uh, to go through Abraham Accords, which is a way of sidestepping Iran, canceling the nuclear deal. Um, which obviously enraged Iran, created destabilization, and Israel was part of that deal. Um, and that was sidestepping, which created this whole issue where Saudi Arabia, in order to stay friends with Iran, uh, they had to back the, um, you know, the whole uh, Palestinian cause, which is the one that is blown up and led to what we had on the 7th uh, of October. And so anyway, in the Yemenis um, politics, we had these different types of militia groups, ISIS getting in there. Uh, we had these major, major humanitarian crisis in Yemen and Syria. We had Saudi Arabia, um, which in the Yemen case was backing the government. The Houthis was a resistance movement against that. Then US and UK come in and they start bombing, uh, created one of the largest humanitarian crises. And then the same was the opposite in Syria, uh, where uh, Saudi Arabia was funding some of the militia groups uh, that were fighting against the existing government. Um, and then Russia got involved and it created uh, a US retreat and uh, it was getting through normalization, but then Trump decided to move that, remove that deal and decided to go with backing Israel, sidestepping Iran. Um, and then you get in the situation that we are in right now today, where the Houthis then decided that they want to back uh, the Palestinian cause because of the injustice of the genocide that's happening. So they create, they um, essentially implement their version of a financial sanction, which is what we're seeing in the Red Sea right now. That costs Israel billions, that costs everyone billions. Um, they're doing their resistance movement there. And then the US and UK come in, and now Russia is deciding whether it wants to back the Houthis, escalate it further. Iran does some attacks after there was a terrorist attack by ISIS on the 3rd of January. These, again, Iran says that it has to retaliate. It then does a, um, a precision uh, you know, missile into uh, Pakistan to target a certain group member and also into um, exactly what we saw. Israel um, and ISIS then get involved and we end up in the situation. I just wanted to rush through it a little bit. Um, so you can get up to date with where we are right now. If the Palestinian cause is not resolved, this is going to escalate. The U.S. knows it. The U.S. wants to put together a two-state solution. Israel doesn't. Israel wants to ethnically cleanse. And Netanyahu has said, get them out. We want to take over everything. And we'll try and starve them and commit a genocide. South Africa comes along and says, we're going to take Israel to the highest level of court, and that court is currently being, um, you know, being, uh, you know, roll, rolled out in real time as we speak. So that brings us to exactly where we are right now. The media scammed the whole world into thinking that this began in October the seventh, and then because of that, uh, you know, Hamas was used to be framed like their ISIS. Um, which is a completely different type of group based upon their resistance movement. And then we have lots and lots of different truths coming out where the media is being exposed. A lot of people like Piers Morgan are backtracking when they realize that actually a lot of the deaths on October the 7th were actually the, um, the Hannibal Directive where Israel was blowing up their own people as well. And Hamas was obviously responsible for some of those killings. There was no 40 beheaded babies. There was none of the things that they said. There's no evidence of that. And then he realized it is a hostage swap here that they were trying to execute. 
Uh, some of those atrocities obviously did happen, but it was completely portrayed differently. And then there is a different movement happening around the truth and more and more are pivoting. Israel is saying we will not do it. We will not give any of that land back to uh, the Palestinians. And so that brings us back where we are, where the Iranian um, f will continue to fund the, mili the militia um, groups. And therefore, until you solve the Palestinian cause, you will have this destabilization. Now, the problem is, is that Israel didn't win the, the say the way that it did. It's kind of like the Russia-Ukraine situation. The weakening, the, the, the fast solution isn't happening. And therefore, it's getting politically destabilizing. And so that brings us to where we are right now um, after uh, this. And more and more people are being educated into, you know, maybe it's not quite as simple as the good guys and the bad side, bad guys. But there is actually evil in all of the proof of weapons network. But the destabilizing factor is the fact that normalization is not being chosen. But who's staying out in the whole thing? North Korea is trying to escalate with South Korea. China's coming along and saying, we'll do what America did during World War II. We will make sure our country doesn't, um, doesn't, isn't involved in it, but we will negotiate and try and solve peace, which is the role. But unfortunately, America has taken its side. They said, we're with Israel. We stand by Israel. We're with Saudi Arabia. We're against Russia. We're against China. And therefore, they can no longer normalize and fulfill the role of world leader. And don't get me wrong, none of these proof of weapons networks are going to be any better. But it's cyclical based upon the debt and the ability to perform and do what America did in World War II. China looks like it's going to try and perform that role. But also, it wants to reunify one of it with Taiwan, obviously. And so the proof of weapons network is escalating and escalating and escalating, where now we have many, many nuclear countries, um, like Pakistan has 170 different nukes, Russia's deciding what it's going to do, China's deciding what it's going to do, America and US have escalated, and so World War Three is a real threat, all because the world tried to plaster over and create lots of propaganda around October the 7th to hide the illegal occupations and settlements that are happening as Israel has been stealing land from the Palestinians um, and uh, uh, performing an ethnical cleansing and genocide when there were already about five different versions of October the 7th, but Israel inflicting those upon Palestine before that. So there we go, South Africa to the rescue. So what is it all going to come down to in the end this year? It's going to come down to World War III and the expansion of which proof of weapons network will be involved will actually probably be whether nuclear can hold peace. Because at the end of the day, nobody wants to do it apart from one hidden nuclear network, proof of weapons network called Israel right now that does have nuclear power in breach of all the agreements, but America can no longer win their election. And the fact that we've had social media revealing all of this, it probably leads to de-escalation. So will Israel allow for a two-state solution? Then we can have a chance of not having World War III. Um, and will America um, decide to escalate if Israel goes rogue? And that will really determine which proof of weapons network goes. If we escalate to World War III, my prediction is China will stay on the side, China will negotiate peace, and the BRICS network will go for further and further de-dollarization as every time someone gets involved, you'll have America will sanction, weakening the dollar, making it less and less useful as a world reserve currency, and you'll enter into a monetary renegotiation. Remember my video series, if you've got, if you go to simondixon.com and you enter there and you go to my membership site in 2000, I talked about the Great Depression of the 2020s. And in the Great Depression of the 2020s, I was getting everyone ready for a monetary renegotiation like Bretton Woods and how to protect yourself for all outcomes. Thankfully, many people listened to it. 
Um, but you can still get that video series for free at simondixon.com. So are we going to end up, for example, Boris Johnson at one stage, he went over to Russia when Russia and Ukraine were about to sign a peace treaty. And he said, no, take more money from America. Take more money from UK. We need to roll over the proof of weapons network. And he persuaded Ukraine to avoid peace negotiations with Russia so that they could push forward the proof of weapons network backed by the military industrial complexes of the existing world orders. So it all depends on what happens with the Palestinian cause in terms of whether we escalate to World War III or not and who ends up in the next superpower. So that then brings us to where we are, more escalation in February. There is no sign of this turning around right now. Um, now let's move forward to predictions for the rest of the year based on our understanding of where we are with proof of work the most successful ETF, people will discover that when you leave money with a centralized, you then have to, you can then have the off ramps in order to go decentralized, own your own money. And then the escalations in the proof of weapons network that will lead to central bank digital currencies in a world of Bitcoin and CBDCs that will then probably be backed to the CBDCs by the other type of network, which is a proof of state network. So what do I expect in March? I'm expecting in March, remember the third thing I said, you'll have Binance. They'll look for an orderly wind down there. All the other bankrupt companies, they wiped out all the fraud. They then take all the companies that they want to support that now get involved in Bitcoin. Everyone starts pitching Bitcoin in your pension through these ETFs. You decide which ones are going to be friends of Bitcoin, enemies of Bitcoin. Then you unwind digital currency group through the GBTC, um, unwinding over to the TradFi players. Uh, then you go through um, stablecoin regulation. So by March, I expect some of these bills to be uh, progressed with stablecoin regulations in the US. That will determine who controls the proof of stake networks that will back many of these stable coins. And so that will move into conversations around who wants to own the proof of state networks. Because remember, proof of work is backed by electricity by anybody that wants to roll up a node or mine. But proof of stake is owned by anyone that wants to own the network. So the ETFs will probably come through and that gets me through to future predictions. But let's stick on March. Um, I expect um, significant more regulations around stable coins, both in uh, Hong Kong, US and various other jurisdictions. That then brings us over to April. April, we get the SBF sentencing. I think he's going to get about 10 or 20 years. He's up for about 115 years for all the fraud that happened in the FTX bankruptcy. But remember, the FTX will probably follow the same thing. FTX, because it didn't have someone like myself, as we had in the Celsius case, lobbying to keep the Bitcoin, they sold all the Bitcoin at the bottom of the market. And so therefore, they did the typical dollarization strategy and FTX creditors get wrecked as a result of that, rather than benefiting from the upside. In May, we have the launch of the outcome of the bankruptcy because Bitcoin, the Celsius bankruptcy, kept the Bitcoin. Um, they're going to take some of the proof of web, uh, the proof of work assets, roll it into a public company, and there'll be a new public company that will come from the Celsius bankruptcy because it managed to keep some of the Bitcoin and go out. So I'm expecting something like that to happen around about May. Um, I'll be a board observer on that company um, as a result of being one of the largest creditors in that. Its equipment is somewhat outdated but maybe it will have a future strategy to hedge against that as well. So watch that one on the proof of work network, meeting the proof of weapons network with the stock market. In June, my next forecast, uh, we are seeing in China the beta for the world of central bank digital currencies. And so DCEP, the, the central bank digital currency in China, is a model for what the rest of the world will do. It's really interesting in China right now, they're actually letting banks go bust rather than rolling over those networks, as we saw in the dollar proof of weapons network. 
So rather than in 2022, allowing banks to go bust, like free markets would dictate, China's doing the free market part and the China Communist Party is actually allowing the banks to go bust, deleveraging and doing more free market policy. So we're seeing this act out in real time, but they're also getting more and more adoption for their central bank digital currency. I believe that by uh, June, up to 1% of the money supply will be a digital central bank digital currency as they roll out integration with uh, you know, uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay and some of the other bank networks that have been doing the integration into the central bank digital currency integrated with a social credit score, which by the way, in America, a FICO score is getting closer and closer with ESG and carbon credit scores, which are initiatives from the World Economic Forum, which just had their conference in Davos to make the US look more and more like a social credit, a social credit score like we see in China. As I said, the central bank digital currency, proof of weapons networks, all those capitalist countries look more like communist countries and all those communist countries look more like capitalist countries and they meet in the middle with a central bank digital currency. Trump came along and said, I won't let it happen if you vote in me, but no politician is bigger than the systemic nature of the system. So then it brings us over to July. Well, what is going to back some of these central bank digital currencies? Well, obviously, every bank in the world is going to want to own the network. How are they going to own the network? The ETH ETF. So by with Bitcoin, when BlackRock and all the different providers are competing to own Bitcoin, they don't control the network because of the way the proof of web, the proof of work network is structured. However, Ethereum has a bunch of pre-mines to those that created it. And anyone that owns the stake ends up controlling a vast part of the network. All the different banks and ETF providers are going to move over to control a part of the ETH network through having a governance structure integrated into ETH ETFs. I believe that by July, we'll probably get some approval there because they'll figure out that this is another network that can be controlled through much like you know, uh, some of the other ETFs can be used in order to get board control of many of the other companies. And this is where crypto suddenly comes to meet. And you really start to understand how the proof of weapon, the proof of weapons network of CBDCs can be on a centralized network um, in order to have to deleverage and move more towards capitalism turning into communism. Um, and then you have the proof of work network, which is an exit from the system. But the proof of stake network is going to be controlled by those that try and own it through Ethereum ETS. If you're enjoying this content, we're almost over halfway through 2024. Um, hit the like button while I take a quick water break. Uh, we even blew up the lights. I think the proof of weapons network didn't like what I'm saying. And we got the bad lighting. And for some reason, uh, we I think we had a little bit of a trip uh, from that, uh, from the proof of weapons network that was paying for this lighting. Thankfully, the proof of works network is allowing me uh, to pay the bills and keep the lights on. OK, um, do me a favor. YouTube algorithm, hit the like button, put a comment below this if you're watching the recording. Um, and because uh, I need that. Uh, in order to hit the algorithm so more and more people can protect themselves. Okay, so we're now moving over to August. Uh, this is when I think that the US is going to remove support for Ukraine on the proof of weapons network. And then depending on what happens in the geopolitical side, they'll recognize that Israel and America We'll find out whether Israel owns America through the Israel lobby or whether America will actually retake control of its elections and say, sorry, we can no longer support this genocidal cause, this ethnic cleansing. And we need to prove that the only way we get the vote of the American people 
Remember, Trump is really big in the Israel lobby. Almost all of his funding comes from Israel. Same with um, uh, Biden at the moment. It will make no difference. They will roll over the proof of weapons network. But will it become political to go against Israel in order to win the vote of Americans? And then if that happens, I think Trump will go in because he's like an anti-establishment movement. And the way that we might get this breaking of the American-Israeli cause is by proving to America that they do uphold the Constitution. The bit that I love about the American Proof of Weapons Network more than any others is the American Constitution. The American Constitution is the most beautiful document and its amendments that were ever written. But in the case of Israel, they even removed the First Amendment by banning, getting Congress for all the funding that it gives to ban, um, you know, make it where boycotting becomes illegal, which the court ruled that it's no longer a First uh, Amendment to the Constitution and they don't believe in freedom to boycott. That's the extent of the funding that comes from all the individual politicians that own Congress that we are experiencing right now. I also believe that China will be the only one that's able to broker peace negotiations and normalization as long as it doesn't reunify with Taiwan. But once it does negotiate those peace, it will probably go through the reunification on the proof of weapons network, just like it did when I lived in Hong Kong. Um, because remember, Hong Kong was just a hangover from the opium wars where the colonialists of the British Empire created a bank called HSBC in order to fund the drug cartels to get China addicted to opium that it got from India through its colonial expansion in order to raid India of its gold and raid China of its silver. And that led to a negotiation where they took over a part of China called Hong Kong, but they had to give it back. And similar in World War II, there was America was backing both the China Communist Party and the China Nationalist Party, did a similar thing to what Britain did with the Balfour Declaration, where it promised both sides the same land. Well, Taiwan has the same hangover effect. Um, when the China Nationalist Party became an independent government. There's a new leader in Taiwan right now that was just elected, and that is looking like it's heating up in terms of proof of weapons network escalations. But I do believe the political pressure to no longer fund the Israeli shekel proof of weapons network will become so pressurized that America will have to focus on its borders and get to supporting America and all of the problems that have been created through wealth inequality as a result of the systemic nature of a world reserve currency that always pushes the wealth from the poorest in society that pay the highest interest rate to the wealthiest in society that are connected to the Federal Reserve as the billionaires in the system renegotiate the monetary system to benefit from them and it moves away from hard money. So I think that will happen by August as we move to the American election of the current world reserve currency of the proof of weapons network. In September, in the Bitcoin side, we get to see Mazinski, um, Alex Mazinski and uh, Daniel Leone, who is now Daniel Leone, the co-founder of the $3 billion fraud, actually decided to create a new AI startup with customers of the Prime Minister's Office of Israel. So Mazinski is going to go to trial because he lives in America, but Daniel Leone is not going to trial. He makes a partnership with the Israeli government for his new AI startup, um, but Mazinski will be trialed. He's got up to 115 years for defrauding $3 billion from many people's pension and retirement fund. And then that will be the last of the crypto fraud that was busted in 2022 so that we can move on with the industry with tighter and tighter regulations and those regulations being pushed back against by funding Bitcoin core development in the proof of work network that maintains the ability for individuals to self-custody, own their own money, spend their own money and combat the inflation that happens as we pivot from quantitative tightening to quantitative eating. 
So in October, as we get closer and closer to the negotiations, I think China will broker normalization around Iran and Saudi Arabia, the real peace deal that allows us to progress and that will sidestep the Israeli goals of getting rid of the Palestinian cause and allowing genocide all thanks to social media. And this will create a stabilizing effect where the wars and the human rights atrocities all around the world will go through a new cause where Yemeni, Yemen, the, um, the incredible humanitarian crisis, everything will be filmed from now on. Syria and all the other ones that are happening in African regions as we enter into this new world of wars on the proof of weapons network, not being able to control the media anymore so that we get the truth through social media, depending on if we can control, you know, still maintain control and freedom of speech that is built into the constitution and depending on what happens. And remember, every proof of weapons network, the next one won't be better, whether it's China, whether it's BRICS, it will be the same stuff, it's systemic. And that's why the Bitcoin apolitical proof of weapon, proof of work network becomes so important. But I believe at this stage, throughout this year, US is going to pivot from quantitative tightening to quantitative easing, because to win the four-year cycle, you have to make the economy look better. You have to promise more and more spending. More and more spending means that you can you can try and persuade the election. Uh, the lobby groups will fund those different politicians. And I do believe that by November, Argentina will probably decide to pivot and adopt rather than the USD pivot. I think it will be the next country to implement a Bitcoin standard or Bitcoin legal tender, as well as other countries in the Middle East, as a result of what they're experiencing. So this one's a bit more controversial. I wouldn't put much money behind it, but I do believe that Argentina would pivot away from a USD standard to maybe a BRIC standard hedged with legal tender around Bitcoin similar to El Salvador did. And that brings us over to the end of the year. And by December, I think there will be a race by countries to mine the last Bitcoin in the proof of work network that in April and May will go through its halving cycle. Half the number of Bitcoins that will be mined every 10 minutes. And I think it will be a race. I think those that have been shafted by the US dollar proof of weapons network will be the ones that are more likely to be mining the last Bitcoin on the proof of work network that will create scarcity, the halving cycle, and those that uh, will, the, the pension funds that bought the Bitcoin ETF that had, were the strong hands during this price correction because they don't understand the larger geopolitical trends around the proof of work network. Um, those pensions will look at their pension and they'll say, I had a 60 40, 60% 60 in government bonds. Those rates are going to go down. And suddenly it could trigger what we saw in 2023 with the US bank run crisis that exposes more and more of those assets, the $650 billion in assets that were rolled over into this Ponzi scheme on the Federal Reserve balance sheet with a central bank digital currency potentially launched and Trump saying that he can fight that effect. It will be systemic and it will happen anyway. Maybe not this year, maybe next year, but it's inevitable, predictable, and guaranteed when you're running a debt-based Ponzi scheme. Um, so I think you're going to see Saudi Arabia going into Bitcoin mining. Abu Dhabi, they're already doing mining ETFs. I think more like the sanctioned countries like Iran, they have um, started getting more into Bitcoin mining. Russia started getting more into Bitcoin mining. And America is aggressively looking to get their piece of tax out of that um, as they try to tax more and more of it. Um, as they increase more and more sanctions, as the dollar becomes less useful to more people, in you'll see more and more market cap for these alternatives. The people in pension, they'll receive less than 5% on future bonds. The stock market will be funded by QE for as long as 
the communist central bank digital currency is willing to allow for people to borrow at cheaper interest rates from the central bank and use it to pump up their stock. That will produce their average of 20% if we don't escalate into World War III. If we escalate into World War III, then look at my previous episodes where I covered wartime economics. The stock market will just be shut. You won't be able to access your wealth. And then you'll understand that those Bitcoin ETFs, where the stock markets are shut during war, is why you needed to own your own money, spend your own money, and have some Bitcoin and self-custody and gold as a hedge. And so it will become really clear by the end of the year, moving into 2025, as we move through the fifth Bitcoin proof of work cycle, I think more countries will make it legal tender. And I think you could actually see one of the most interesting, and this will be my most outrageous prediction of them all, in December, you could see a real two-state solution where a country like Palestine adopts halal forms of hard money as legal tender, like Bitcoin, and Israel rolls over the proof of weapons fiat currency network, and you get a real two-state solution, not through borders, but by currency wars. El Salvador has already shown, and MicroStrategy has already shown, what that looks like on the sovereign and the corporate level. Maybe, just maybe, halal form of money, rather than haram, RIBA-based proof-of-work weapons networks, can actually be used to demonstrate a currency war two-state solution as you have a central bank digital currency backed by Bitcoin. And remember, in 2025, the Bank for International Settlements releases their stablecoin and central bank digital currency rules around how you can back your central bank digital currencies by either Bitcoin or other CBDCs. And so we're going to see a global competition for central bank digital currencies, and the one that will win, in my prediction, over the next decade will be the one that integrates the most amount of freedom against the one that integrates the most amount of oppression. And you could get a, cle a complete flippening, as I said, when CBDCs become this network where communist countries look more and more capitalist, capitalist countries look more and more communist, and if they don't reverse those trends, and I think you could see that never more highlighted than what you could see in a region that needs to rebuild. And remember, we're going to get the Bitcoin bond in Q1 from El Salvador, and if that dwarfs the debt from the IMF debt and El Salvador debt that was created from all those funding of civil wars and complete killing and atrocity from the proof of weapons networks, that would demonstrate to the country that we can have this stabilizing force of a geopolitically neutral proof of work network competing with proof of weapons network and how you back it by Bitcoin. We could move more and more towards a Bitcoin standard and a complete demonstration of the destructive force of the fractional reserve banking system over the next decade. That's my more outrageous prediction, but I think the foundation is being set. And remember, in my book, Bank to the Future, when I started writing it in 2010 and published it in 2011, it talked about how proof of weapons networks transition because of debt-based Ponzi schemes to the equivalent of central bank digital currencies and how you can exit that. And it was the first published book in the world to include Bitcoin. So for those of you that want to stay on top of the trend, if you are not a member of the membership portal at simondixon.com, make sure you sign up there. You can get all of my different videos from the past emergency broadcasts, and I'll make sure I message you everything that's going on um, with preparing yourself for a world of Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies. Sorry we blew up the lighting and I look all red and funny. Uh, and sorry for the little transmission in between. Hopefully we'll get that better uh, for next week. 
And always remember, you are alive at one of the most interesting and exciting times in financial history. Some are going to get wrecked. Others are going to do really well. And I want to make sure that you are on the right side of that change. So if you believe in that mission, please like this video, help the YouTube algorithms. Please subscribe to this channel. Hit the bell symbol. Hit all. YouTube will notify you every time we go live. And head over to simondixon.com and I'll message you and mail you every time I think you need to know something about transitioning to a world of Bitcoin and CBDCs. I want you to be on the network of peace, love, and unity as we eat the proof of weapons network based upon military might and force and destruction. And we transition together. So that's going to do it. This is episode 17 with my 2024 Bitcoin and CBDC macro and uh, geopolitical predictions and Bitcoin. And I'll see you in the next episode next week for episode 18. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to see, what you liked about this, what you didn't like about this. Peace.